I was asked to speak on tips to improve your ability to detect, inspect, and characterize colon polyps. And uh, I wanted to at least try to give you some tips that are practical. I mean, give you tips that don't make any sense and you can do in theory. Um, so hopefully you can walk away with this with some tangible tips you can use in your own practice starting on Monday. My disclosures, consultant for Boston Scientific and Aries hasn't changed since yesterday. So let's talk about colon polyps. Let's talk about detection, inspection, and characterization. So when you talk about detection with colon polyps, I don't think you can give a talk on colon polyps and use the word detect without talking about adenoma detection rate, or the ADR. So the ADR is defined as simply the number of colonoscopies with at least one adenoma over your total number of colonoscopies, right? It's a pretty simple calculation. So I'll give you an example. In a morning session, you say you do 10 colonoscopies. On four of the patients, you find a polyp or an adenoma, right? Not just a hyperplastic polyp, but an adenoma. Your ADR would be 40%, right? Pretty simple calculation there. So the ADR was first established in 2002 with the Multi-Society Task Force. That's all the gastroenterology uh, committees together. And they decided at that time to define the ADR as the percent of persons age 50 or greater with at least one adenoma. And the benchmarks at that time were 25% for men and 15% for women. In 2006, the ACG and the ASG had a task force that redefined what the ADR was. And this time they defined it as the percentage of first time screening colonoscopies in persons age greater than 50 with at least one adenoma. They got rid of all colonoscopies because they found that patients who were coming back for a surveillance colonoscopy had a much higher rate of polyps, which is probably not surprising. And they left the benchmarks unchanged. So still 25% for men, 15% for women, but again, just screening colonoscopies when they're defining an ADR. And then more recently in 2015, the ACG and ASG Task Force on Quality got together again and they decided to increase the benchmarks. Now 30% for men and 20% for women. So just a final summary on what an ADR is defined now in 2018. Asymptomatic men and women over the age of 50 undergoing screening colonoscopies, your adenovitectin rate should be greater than 30% for men or in your, in, your, in your male patient population and 20% for women. And why is the ADR important, right? We talk about ADR, 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 but why is it important? Well, really the most important aspect of it and the whole purpose we do colonoscopy is to try to prevent cancers, right? So you talk about interval cancers, here's your baseline colonoscopy. If you have no polyps, you tell your patients come back in 10 years. If you have one to two, two of adenomas, it's come back in five. High risk adenoma or multiple polyps has come back in three. So an interval cancer is basically any cancer that develops between the time you do your first screening colonoscopy with when you tell them to come back, right? And the studies have found that the rate of interval cancer in this one study was 0.6%. Right, in a population of 9,167 patients. So these are all patients who had a polypectomy performed at the time of their screening colonoscopy. So one in 150 patients were diagnosed with an interval colon cancer after polypectomy. I think it's a bit humbling, right? I mean, many of us do more than 150 colonoscopies in a year. If you do 1,000 colonoscopies a year, you're gonna have you know, four or five patients who are gonna develop a cancer despite the fact that they had a screening colonoscopy with you this year. So why is the ADR important? Well. When they've done these studies, this is a Polish database in 2000, 2004. This was published in the New England Journal. They looked at uh, a number of different endoscopists, um, and they rated them based on their ADR percentage, right? So in here, purple, the ADR was very low, 11% ADR. The highest group, the yellow, had an ADR greater than 20%. Right? This is back in 2004, where the benchmarks were much lower. When they looked at the hazard ratios, they basically found that if you had your colonoscopy done by a physician or endoscopist with a very high ADR or greater than 20% in this study, your rate of having uh, interval colon cancer was very low. But if you had a, your, your colonoscopy done by a physician with a very low ADR, your risk of having an interval cancer was 12 times higher than those who got colonoscopies done by a better physician or a more thorough physician who had a high ADR, right? So I think that's pretty significant. And basically, they're proving, what their point was that ADR is an independent predictor of the risk of interval cancer, right? And further studies have now shown that each 1% increase in your ADR is associated with a 3% decrease in the incidence of interval colorectal cancer and a 5% decrease in the incidence of fatal colorectal cancer. And that's pretty surprising, pretty, you know, 
These are, these are just facts based on the data. And you can't deny that. And so they also found that increasing ADR is cost effective. So if you have a high ADR, the thought is you're going to, pay, you're going to bring more patients back for repeat colonoscopies, right? Because you found one, you got to bring it back for another surveillance colonoscopy and say, three years or five years as opposed to 10 years. But that the higher cost of more colonoscopies is actually outweighed by the reduction in cost of colorectal cancer care, right? It's very expensive to treat colon cancer, all the imaging, the chemotherapy, the surgeries. And so if you pick up cancers early, prevent cancer from actually happening by doing more colonoscopies, it actually saves money for the healthcare system. So now we can finally talk about detection of polyps, right? And so this is a cartoon here. I think you look at it two different ways. You have the one fish saying, whoa, half empty, definitely half empty, he can't breathe. And the other guy saying, uh, just listen to you, always the pessimist, right? So why, let's talk about why do we miss polyps or why, why are ADRs low in certain endoscopists? Well, we can always blame the patient, right? You can say the bowel prep was poor, that's not my fault, it's their fault, they didn't do a good job. Um, so you can always blame the patient. The other thing you can do is blame the biology of the polyps, right? Maybe the polyps are flat, they're sessile, we know that we can't, we're not as good as detecting polyps in the right colon because they're, they're shaped differently, they're flat, and maybe you're missing them. They're small polyps that could easily be overlooked. Uh, or they're made a difficult location, right? They're behind the fold, you can't see it. Um, so you can blame the polyps themselves for the reason the patient's developed an interval cancer. But the reality is probably has something to do with the physician, right? We're maybe using poor technique, we're not looking carefully behind folds and turns, there's residual debris that wasn't cleaned out or washed out that could have been cleaned out. Um, inadequately distending the colon during your colonoscopy. We know that withdrawal time has been shown repeatedly to increase your ADR, so if you have withdrawal time greater than six minutes, so it's associated with a higher ADR rate. Uh, generalized fatigue, right, so afternoon colonoscopy, you've done 15 colonoscopies already, your 16th, 17th, 18th colonoscopies may not be as thorough as the one you've done in the morning. And physicians are human, right? We make mistakes, we're not perfect, um, and so we can just miss polyps, right? That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at detection is, how can we do better, right? So rather than looking at why are we missing them, let's try to figure out how we can fix this problem. So we talked about bowel prep in the last talk with Jason. Uh, split dose bowel preparation has now become the standard uh, for bowel preps. That's because it's shown to increase the quality of the bowel prep. And so anything we can do to improve the quality of the bowel prep, hopefully we can detect more polyps. Equipment, we have high definition white light. The idea of using chromoendoscopy, which we don't really use in this country very much, but the idea is that we have better equipment now, right? So even when I look at the old colonoscopies, the old colonoscopes, the newer ones we have in our, in our hospitals, the high definition white light is so much better than the ones I see from just a few years ago. I can only imagine what colonoscopy was like 20 years ago, and maybe even some of you guys were practicing. I can see I can miss polyps because you just couldn't see them, right? The quality of the, of the, uh, the video now is so much better than it was before. There are also adjunctive therapies or adjunctive uh, tools we can use. We have caps or distal attachments you can place on the end of the scope. The endo cuff or endo ring devices can also be placed on the end of the scope. Uh, and then there's this third eye device where you can pass this third eye camera through the instrument channel, which then you can retroflex to take a look behind folds. Uh, and these are all things you can potentially do, but they obviously cost money. Uh, and you have to become fast out with using these, uh, these devices. And again, we can go back to the physician, right? Proper technique, so training. So either retraining for physicians who are doing this and doing this wrong for the, for in practice, or just training fellows how to do it properly when they're in training. Um, they've shown all these other things to increase ADR. So the publication you can find on any one of these topics. Um, so not just training on how to scope, but training on how to identify polyps, right? So not just looking for big pedunculated polyps, but looking for flat sessile polyps um, and being able to recognize them. They know that if you start publicly reporting the data. So if I start telling you that we're gonna start reporting your data into, on, on the internet or in the news, uh, they've shown that the ADR rate goes up. I think mostly because we're more conscientious. If I told you I'm gonna start video recording your colonoscopies and someone's gonna look at them again after the fact, that also increases ADR. We talked about withdrawal time, makes sense. Long withdrawal time, you're being more thorough. You can always game the system. You could just, if you wanna increase your withdrawal time, you can just sit there and do nothing for five minutes and then just whip the, whip the scope out. That doesn't really increase your ADR. Right? But the whole idea is, if you're spending the time to look around and doing a more thorough job, you're likely to find more polyps. Uh, they've done studies looking at repositioning the patient, so putting the patient on their back or on the right lateral, that may increase your ADR as well. And this idea of looking in the colon, in the right colon, and the proximal colon a second time, either in four view, so you go from the cecum to the hepatic flexure, and then back in the cecum to the hepatic flexure again, 
or doing retroflexion in the cecum, looking at the right colon um, backwards. So I think if I had to give you any tips on how to better detect polyps, i just pick a couple. And I'm just, again, trying to be practical here because um, some of these things are going to be much more difficult to implement. So I think the idea of taking a look in, this, in the right colon twice, whether it be in forward view or in retroflexion, I think um, is a proven technique for increasing ADR and something that's very easy to do without causing you guys a lot of additional time or money. So there's a second look in the right colon. Number two would be retroflexion in the right colon. So when they've compared these two techniques, right, either forward view it twice or just going to the cecum and looking back in retroflexion, this is a study that was done, uh, look at 850 patients who've ha had clearance of the right colon. You've now gone to the cecum, looked at the right colon, you basically, you know, did your entire insertion. You're going to basically decide, it randomized now to either looking at the right colon twice in forward view or doing a retroflex view. And they looked at how many of these patients actually had one more adenoma detected during this maneuver. And they basically found that if you look, do a second forward view, you found an extra polyp 10.5% of the time. And if you did a retroflex view, you found a polyp 7.5% of the time. This was not statistically significant. So the point being, they're about equivalent. Right? But if you take a look a second time, 7.5 to 10% of the time, you're finding an additional polyp in the right colon. I think that's a significant percentage of patients. So when to examine the right colon twice, I mean, certainly you can try doing it on every patient. I think it's sometimes difficult to do retroflexion in the right colon. I don't think you guys have ever tried that. I think it's much easier in patients where you have a short scope. The patient's colon is pretty straight and, and not so tortuous. You get to see them with the, um, without too much difficulty. You may find that you can easily retroflex in the right colon without, without too much uh, strife. Um, but I think you can do it in every patient if you want. If you want to try to think about which patients may be at higher risk for having polyps in the right colon, if you, if you find that you find a, col a polyp on the way in, in the right colon, then you're more likely to find more polyps when you look again the second time. Patients who are a bit older, male patients, because you know that male patients have a higher percentage of, of polyps, and patients with Lynch syndrome, who we know or higher risk for colon cancer. So certainly you can do it in every patient, but if you had to risk stratify or decide who you're going to do this, this additional look for, these are the patients that you may want to focus on. And again, just remember that the second view of the right colon is equal you know, forward view or retroflexion, so whatever you're more comfortable with. I'll give you one other tip, and that's to use this cap. Right? And I think you've seen this demonstrated in the video forum. I think people have been um, using this more and more. It's a simple piece of clear plastic that's attached to the distal end of the colonoscope. Such a simple idea. It basically flattens mucosal folds, and so it improves visibility of the proximal side of the folds, and can aid in resection of flat colon polyps. And one of the questions that uh, Ali asked me during the video form was when to use a cap. Uh, I certainly use it in certain scenarios, like you know the polyp sitting on a fold or on the IC valve, where you know that a cap is going to help depress the fold so you can then go ahead and do your work in terms of resecting the polyp. But in terms of routine screening, this cap has been shown to increase ADR. And I'll just try to hopefully demonstrate this. So this is a, I mean, I don't do a lot of screening colonoscopies. You get patients referred for a colon polyp, but you can see there's a tattoo marking the polyp. But there's a subtle polyp right there on the fold. And I always applaud the, uh, the GF physicians who, who send, me these pa send me these patients because some of these polyps are very hard to find, even for me when I'm looking a second time when I know there's a polyp there, right? But there's a subtle polyp right there on that fold, and having this cap can help you depress the fold just distal to it to better access this polyp or better visualize this polyp. And there's the polyp right there. It's just demonstrating the cap. It does take a little bit of work to get used to um, because your, your, um, your, your view is a little bit um, narrowed by having this cap despite the fact that it's clear. And when you insert the scope through the, to the, to the left colon, it takes a little bit of work to get through some of these areas that are not, not distended. But I don't think it's a steep learning curve and it's certainly very safe and easy to implement into your practice. So multiple meta-analyses have shown that the, uh, the cap-assisted colonoscopy improves ADR versus standard colonoscopy. And particularly, it's been shown to increase the ADR in the proximal colon for flat adenomas and cell cell serrated adenomas. 
Okay, so there's my tips for detection. I'm gonna move to inspection. In terms of inspecting polyps, I think this is something we do kind of immediately, right? You see a polyp, you quickly assess how, how what the size of it is, is it small or large, is it pedunculated or flat, uh, where is it located in the colon, and then is it easy to snare or is it difficult? Or is it a difficult location, whether it be you know, you can't get it to six, you can't get it down to six o'clock, it's in the, it's on the hepatic flexure, on the valve, around the penseal orifice. These are all things that we inspect very quickly. But I think that there, there's some main points that you want to address when you're looking at a polyp. I think the main question is, is this polyp benign or is it malignant? Right? You want to know where is it on the spectrum? Is this a, this is a benign thing where you can hopefully remove or someone else can remove safely endoscopically, or is this a cancer that needs to be removed surgically? And so there are different ways to look at this. I mean, certainly with high definition white light, you're looking for ulcerations or depressions in the polyps, just the picture on the right. The one on the left is a picture of a non-granular laterally spreading tumor, and so you can see this is a polyp, but it's, it's not very granular, so this is called a non-granular, and it's a higher risk of, of malignant potential. You could do virtual chromoendoscopy. That's essentially using things like narrowband imaging on Olympus scopes or eye scan on the Pentax scope uh, to help delineate the border to look for disrupted or missing vessels on the surface of the polyp. And then submucosal injection with some sort of dye will help delineate the polyp further as well. So here's a polyp in white light. You can barely even see it. With narrowband imaging, you can start to delineate the borders of this polyp. It's still a very subtle. And then with the submucosal injection, you can, again, better delineate the, the borders of this polyp here and here, but it's a very, very flat, subtle polyp that can easily be missed, especially with the poor prep. So here's a polyp, I don't think it's that hard to detect or to identify, but certainly I think it, when you start to think about resecting this polyp, you wanna make sure you get it all out. And so I'm doing a white light, high definition white light exam to start, and sometimes the border of this polyp are hard to identify. You see a little bit of this, what they call chicken skin appearance, uh, along the edges of the polyp. Is that part of the polyp or is that just outside the polyps? A little unclear. I'm gonna do some narrowband imaging now. Again, there's that chicken, chicken skin appearance. With narrowband imaging, you start to identify the polyp versus the normal mucosa around it. And certainly this edge with some, little, some blood on it makes it very hard to see under narrowband imaging. The next part is, you know, at some point you gotta take this polyp out. And so here I'm gonna inject it with methylene blue and saline. And I think injecting this polyp will definitely delineate the, the polyp even better. And you're gonna see as I inject this, the polyp borders become much more obvious. See, you can see the polyp right there. I think it's pretty easy to tell. I went ahead and took this polyp off on block, but the idea was, um, yeah, there is, there's the video, the rest of it. But I think the semicosal injection certainly helped inspect the edges of this polyp. So that when you do the resection, you can clearly tell if you got this removed entirely or if you left some polyp behind. Again, these are, an inspection, I think, is something we do pretty naturally, right? We look at a white light, you're not sure, use narrowband imaging or eye scan, and then you can inject it to make sure. And there's my polyp resection. There's my EMR defect, looks pretty clean. I don't see any residual polyp. Move on, okay? And then the last thing is possible biopsy. And I think, talk about biopsy, I'd say only biopsy if you're, if you think it's cancer, right? So if you pretty darn sure it's cancer. You want to biopsy it, make the diagnosis so that you can move on, right? If you think it's a, if, you, if you're looking at it and you're like, this is a polyp, then don't biopsy it, because it's a polyp. Let, either take it off entirely at that session, or don't biopsy it and have, you know, refer it out for someone who can take it out in one, in one, in one, uh, in one shot. Because uh, we know that biopsying a polyp can make it more difficult for us to remove polyps the second time around. The other asterisk, the other scenario I'd say is, now, we've been telling people now for a while to not biopsy the lesion if you think it's a polyp, because then you know, it makes it harder for us to remove it when you, when you refer it to an interventional endoscopist to take it out. I've now had a couple scenarios where patients have been referred to me for a polyp that, they, you know, that the gastroenterologist thought they saw, 
and I go looking over and over and over again for 20 minutes, and I can't find a polyp, right? And because they didn't biopsy it, there's nothing proven to say there is a polyp there or not, and I'm looking under white light, narrow band. I sometimes even inject the fold or inject the area that I think might be the polyp in question, only find that there's no polyp, right? And then I gotta finish the procedure, tell the patient there's no polyp, well, my doctor told me there was a polyp, now you're telling me there's no polyp, now I'm like, I don't know. Um, so if you're not sure, uh, and you're not sure if it's a polyp or just a thick fold, then maybe you can biopsy. I think that's a reasonable time to biopsy it, because if it comes back as a normal you know, thickened fold and just normal mucosa, they don't have to refer it out. But that's just a recent thing that's been happening, I think, because the good thing, I think the gastroenterologists are hearing the news that if you see a polyp, don't biopsy it, don't take you know, five bites of it and then expect us to take it out easily um, later on. But on the flip side, I think if you're not sure there's even a polyp there, then biopsy and make sure it's, pathologi it's, it's proven pathologically before referring it to us. And I think the other question is, can I remove the polyp or should I send it to someone else, right? So if you're inspecting a polyp, is it benign or malignant, make that decision, and then decide if you're gonna take it out yourself or should you send it to someone else? And that, that second question is really up to each individual endoscopist, right? If you feel comfortable taking out a one centimeter polyp, take it out. If you don't feel comfortable taking it out, then refer it. Right? I think that's a safe thing to do for the patient and potentially yourself if you're not comfortable taking out a polyp. The last part of this is characterizing the polyps. Uh, I mean, again, I think describing the polyps is pretty, pretty straightforward. There are a number of polyp classification systems out there. Paris, NICE, JNET, lateral spreading tumors, CUDO, PIT patterns. Like we talk about this all day, but I think the reality is none of us are gonna go home and remember these things, right? You look at it at a chart, you can read about it in a paper, but you're not gonna sit there and remember Wait, no, which kudo pit pattern was on that last pop you just saw, right? So I think the point of polyp classifications is, again, determine is the polyp benign or malignant, help you characterize or describe the polyp, the shape of it, the surface morphology, and really the point is to assess the risk of submucosal invasion. Is this something that we can be removed endoscopically or not? The Paris classification, I think, is a nice one to use. I think it's easy to understand. There's protruded lesions. There's these flat lesions, which are you know, flat elevation of mucosa, or completely flat like the one I showed you earlier, or is it depressed? Those are the 2A, 2B, 2C. And then is it excavated, or is it some sort of combination? Right? And again, I don't expect you guys to know this stuff or keep, remember this stuff um, when you walk out of here, but just understand that there's a classification that exists to assess the shape of the polyps and their risk of some mucosal invasion. So you know that we know that polyps that have central depression are at risk for having, or greater risk for having some mucosal invasion or more likely to be malignant. I think the more likely classification you can actually maybe understand or appreciate and maybe potentially use in your pr clinical practice is the NICE classification. So this is a narrow band imaging international colorectal endoscopic uh, classification system. It's actually designed for polyps less than 10 millimeters in size. And the criteria are color, vessels, and surface pattern, and there's types one through three, right? And this is pretty simple. So here are the types. So here's type one. The color is, the, if the polyp has a same or lighter than background color, there's no visible vessels, and the surface pattern is dark, uniform spots, or homogeneous, it's most likely a hyperplastic polyp. All right, so here are some pictures. Here's a little polyp. You do the MBI, kind of appreciate that surface pattern there. It's very organized, there's no, no overlying blood vessels. There's another one there, another one there. Sometimes for hyperplastic polyps, you don't even need a narrow band imaging, right? But again, this classification helps you uh, make that differentiation. If you're comparing this to, I mean, you're in the rectum, you're like, is this hyperplastic polyp or is this an adenoma? Type two, it's the color of the polyp's brown relative to the background, so it's darker. There's brown vessels surrounding the white structures. In the surface pattern, you see these oval or tubular branched white structures surrounded by brown vessels, and this is an adenoma. So again, here's a polyp in white light. There's an airbend imaging. There's that kind of, you can see this pattern here. Um, I kind of think of it like a little brain almost. All right, and then you can appreciate some of the other ones. It's darker than the surrounding area. Right? This pop looks darker than the rest. And again, you can, you can see this overlying um, surface pattern consistent with an adenoma. Right? I think it looks even more prominent here in these tubular structures on the surface. And then type three, again, it's dark. Uh, compared to the background, there's disrupted or missing vessels, and that, I think that's a very important distinction here. And there's an amorphous or absent surface pattern. And these are concerning for deep submucosal invasive cancer. So this is type three. Here's the, here's the white light picture. Here's the narrow band imaging picture. And again, you can see that the, the 
there's the loss of the tubular structures, the vessels are kind of missing, um, and this is more concerning for a cancer, right? Again, this is not rocket science, but again, a very simple push of the button on your scope can help you differentiate between a hyperplastic or an adenoma versus a cancer. So my conclusions, ADR is an independent predictor of the risk of interval colorectal cancer. That's why it's important. That's why we care about ADRs. Tips to improve colorectal colon polyp detection. So one is examine the right colon twice, either in forward view or in retroflexion. They're the same equivalent um, in studies. Or consider using a clear cap on the end of the colonoscope during your colonoscopies. For improving colon polyp inspection, use high definition white light, virtual chromoendoscopy, consider submucosal injection when needed. And improving colon polyp classification, just become familiar with the NICE classification. If you want to learn the other classifications, I think that's great. But I think this is very simple and easy to use in clinical practice. Thank you.